Hello and welcome to The Ally Show. My name is Ali Eslamifar and I'm your host for this show. We are finally here with our episode one with Brad Winters, someone who I had the honor to get to know him when I was working at Quizlet as a product manager. And we ended up building on top of that relationship and having great time as friends. Brad was one of the first people who actually pushed me for doing this show. And I really appreciate his support to make this come to reality. And before getting to the show, there is a little bit of a story that I wanted to share. To start this show, I went through a lot of debates with myself. On one hand, there was this amazing idea that I wanted to do. This story of pain, connecting to people, bringing their story, and turning that to a community. And on the other hand, I was struggling with a lot myself. I was not feeling that this is something that I can do, first and foremost, because this is a very touchy, complex subject. It can fail. I may mess it up. Also, I've never done a podcast in English. My mother tongue is Farsi. I have a meditation podcast in Farsi. And it was really hard for me to put this content out, go to interviews with folks, and record it and do it online. It was different compared to the other settings that I had. Like, I was a product manager. I was a product designer in the past. and I interviewed people, but it was never recorded to go live. This actually, instead of keeping me excited about doing this project, it eventually made me a little bit more depressed that I had to be to start a new project. So there was this morning that I woke up feeling so depressed and I woke up telling myself that you gotta bounce out of this project. Right after that, I checked my phone and I saw a text from Brad where he was asking me, hey buddy, when are we going to record our episode? And that really, at a second, changed my feeling about what I wanted to do. At that moment, he was really an ally for me to get out of my bad habit of bouncing out of projects. and turning that to something that I can do. He gave me that confidence, he gave me that support, and he held me accountable for doing this show. And this is why I believe this is going to work. This platform, we are going to hold each other accountable to do something for our mental health. It always starts from the baby steps, but I love to take all those baby steps with you all who are listening to this show. Of course, if you're suffering from any mental health issues or you think you need help, please contact your mental health or medical experts. This specific story is about the story of a loss. So if that's a sensitive topic to you, please skip this one and hopefully join us for the next story. Also, please read through the disclaimers we have on the notes here for the show and the guests. And I'm not going to hold you for longer than this. Let's start our conversation with Brad Winters. I hope you stay through the end. Brad's campaign is about running one mile run per day. All the links and instructions is added to the show notes. Please refer to those. Let's start this first one together. Well, we are here with Mr. Brad Winters. You have been one of the first people I told uh, about this idea and you were so supportive in that fun sushi place. <laughs> and then uh, I think like you willing to participate, um, that, that's, that's su- super amazing to have that support. We know each other from Quizlet. We do. One of the coolest places I work with, lots of great people. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not there anymore, but it's it's been 
such a great time. Yeah, thank you, Ali. I'm excited to be here, and I think you're. Um, this is right up your alley. I'm excited for you. Um, so I, you know, as Ali mentioned, we we uh, we worked at Quizlet together. We were coworkers, but it doesn't. I feel like the uh, relationship we have doesn't feel like one of a coworker. And I, yeah. I so appreciate all of the how thoughtful you are, all of the conversations that we've had. Um, and I, you know, when you shared this idea with me, I thought this was so cool. Um, so I, I guess some background on me. I grew up in mostly in the Midwest. I spent most of my time in a Chicago suburb called Naperville, and. Uh, I I made a good friend in my sophomore year of high school, uh, a guy named Mihir Budapali. And uh, this guy was a character, man. I don't even know. I he, he was someone who, across all groups of people, all ages, uh, he just was able to connect with everyone. Um, he, he was on the cross-country team. We ran cross-country together. And he ended up being a captain of the cross country team. And he started a thing called Formal Friday, which is where the football team would wear their jerseys on Fridays. And, you know, obviously it's like the classic cool guy football jersey and everything. And we were like, you know, we should have a thing. We should do something. And uh, since we weren't as cool as the football guys, we were like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to wear a button-down shirt with a tie tucked into our short shorts, <laughs> and we're just going to rock that to school. And the entire team, guys and girls, did this. Oh my! There were like 200 people at the school, you know, across both teams wearing these outfits. And this was all like me here. And it was, oh, it was so cool. You had these like 14-year-old scrawny freshmen who probably were looking at these football guys like, oh, they're so cool. And then we were like, this was our thing. And, and everyone... Everyone owned it and loved it, and it was hilarious, and it was fun. There's this photo of us, of just the whole team outside of the school, with the with the shirt and tie and the short shorts. Um, I want to see it, that. Oh, it was so funny. I, I definitely want to see that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and it was he just did things like that. He uh, he also ran for secretary of the school, and his campaign was he cross dressed and put lipstick on. And just posted like almost like risque secretary photos all over the school. Like, I mean, this guy was is just on another level. Um, and so, and that's that's in your hometown still. Like, that's in my hometown. For 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 that those who don't know, where, where where like yes, as far as like Chicago, where which side of Chicago? Yeah, so it's uh, thirty minutes west of Chicago. Thirty minutes west. Okay, nice. Yeah. And how how long you you lived there? I lived. Uh, let's see. So I moved there when I was thirteen and lived there through high school. And then I went to college. I went to Northwestern, which was forty five minutes north of Chicago or thirty minutes north of Chicago. How how was your experience at Northwestern? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I made some of the best friends that I have there, and uh, it was incredible. I think um, I learned a ton. I got a you know a very good education, but it, I mean, it was hard. I especially coming from the like a public school in Illinois, I didn't feel it was hard. It was a transition culturally. It was difficult academically. I think it took me a while to feel like I fit in and like it was my home. I think by the end, I did feel that way. Um, but it certainly wasn't the, you know, you go to college and day one, you're like this, I'm having the most fun of my life, you know. But I think in some ways it was good to force me to go somewhere that was really challenging and and really learn how to how to grow and adapt. And I actually my my story of how I ended up there is actually very influenced by uh, my friend Mihir. He so Mihir has an older brother named Drew, who is I believe eight years older than we are, and he went to MIT and was super smart. And then he worked in actually their admissions office there, and so he then fed me here all of his information on how to go through the college process and you know we i mean we had great college counselors but they weren't quite as equipped to help you get into a school of you know of that caliber and so i remember when i was first taking my my standardized test i took my first practice test 
And I, this was what, sophomore year of high school. I took my first practice test and it was the ACT and I got a 26 and it's out of 36. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, like relative to my grades, it was a much, uh, it, it was like a pretty low, it was well below my expectation. Um, and I remember being just so like taken aback and I was like, okay, I need to, I need to change this. And like, um, me here was a really awesome coach in being like, you can do this. You need to do this. You can do this. Um, and I, I studied a ton. He was super supportive and really kind of pushed me. And then I ended up, I ended up taking it again and getting like a 34. And I remember when that happened, he goes, he goes, come over, we need to talk. And, uh, he basically told me, he's like, so two things. He's like, one, we're going to change all the schools that you apply to and you're applying to a whole new set of schools. So, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, this guy was like on another level. And so he goes, Hey, we're going to, you know, completely change that. And he goes, and then the other thing is this was now in the summer of 2010. So going into my senior year of high school, I graduated in 2011 and he goes, you know, I, I want you to do like a, the, there's like a summer internship that I was going to do. I have two different offers. I'm going to take this one and I want you to take the other one. And he goes, if you do that, and if you apply to these schools, you will, you will get in. And I mean, it was insane. Like this, I, I seriously, and I just followed his guidance. I remember actually a, a conversation I had with my parents after I, I left me here's house. He, it was almost like he was like call, calling me into his office, which was sitting in his basement and playing uh, Xbox together while he while he schooled me up on life lessons. And uh, and I remember going home and talking to my parents that night. And I remember with my dad being like, "I think this is the right decision, but you know, you're going to make a lot less money doing this internship." It was like, an, it, I think I was paid like minimum wage, but I had to commute into Chicago to work at like a lab was what it was. So I like went and worked as a high school kid, taking the train every morning to the city, working in a lab and then coming home. Wow. All my friends made fun of me. Cause I wasn't like I was, I, most people were hanging out during the day. I mean, it's still, still the summer, you're pretty young. And uh, they called me dad. Cause I just took the train every day. <laughs> I, I was like a true, like Such working dad. class person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and what, so, and what made you? <laughs> take like what was special about that experience that you were willing to take that train every day for it i mean i just trusted this guy he knew he knew what i needed to do to get to where i wanted to go how did he know it his brother was a great role model and was older and his he basically followed his brother's playbook and like hacking playbook. yeah exactly yeah so like, uh, and if if I pronounce his name right, Meher, it's M E H E R. M I H I R. His full name was actually Meher Tej Mudapali. Oh, uh, Meher Tej. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's it sounds like Meher uh, had such sense of humor, but at the same time, he was like. Uh, sort of on top of everything. Like, oh yeah. What what what? what if, if you want to tell us a little bit about his background yeah what, what made it that way yeah absolutely um so his parents were um indian immigrants and so and, and they went to college in india um they both had you know i think they both work in like software engineering like technical jobs and were very like sort of in the somewhat standard like immigrant parent uh but child raised here born here raised here um paradigm he they were very traditional and and focused on hard work and all of that and me here had those aspects but also having been raised in america I, I don't know what i don't know is what caused this kid to just be so like such just a like a spark plug of a personality We kind of jump off your great background. I also want to want people to know a little bit about like, I mean, we said you and I, we both work at Quizlet, mm -hmm. but I think it's more as far as like your professional background. If you want to add a few things, just feel free to uh, tell a little bit more about what, what you've done. So I, 
I guess I when I when I graduated from school, I um, I studied industrial engineering and economics, and I was sort of like, you know, what do I want to do? Um, I there was a there was a decision point that I had at that time, which was, do I go? I had interned at LinkedIn, and I had a lot of fun there. It was it was amazing, and but it was in like marketing, and I studied engineering, and so I'm like, you know, do I want to go there? Um, or do I want to go do something a little bit more technical to start? And I knew that I wanted to work in at an internet company. I had such a good experience there. I liked how forward thinking people were. I like how things moved fast. Um, and it was a cool time to be there. I was there. I worked at LinkedIn in the summer of 2014. And so obviously it was very established, but still much smaller than it is today. And so, uh, you know, at that time I said, you know, I wanted to go, well, I had a great experience. I ended up not returning and then going to work at Capital One in like an analytics program out of school. Um, and so that was cool. I, I moved, I lived in Washington, D.C. doing that. And what was really cool about that is from a, from a skills perspective, it was what I wanted. But it was also, I moved to D.C. and I had like two friends. I had a roommate that I knew well from college. And, and then there were like one or two other people that we knew, but it was amazing because it forced me to figure out how do you make a life for yourself? You know, I moved somewhere. I don't really know a lot of people and, uh, everything through high school and college, it's, it's a very structured social environment. And then when you leave and you're just a, you know, a person working in the world, uh, it's, it's on you to figure out how to, how to make a life for yourself, how to make friends. And so, um, that was a really cool experience. I ended up having a great group of friends in DC. I stayed there about two and a half years, um, really enjoyed it and really felt like it was a place, you know, professionally I, I grew, but I, it felt like a personal, more personal growth than a professional growth, I would say, um, which was really great. And then, um, in the, in the fall of 2017, I finally said, okay, I know I want to go back to, to an internet company. I wanted to live in the Bay area. And so I, um, I moved out here. I worked at Facebook, uh, on the finance team there. Um, and I joined a team, it was called the revenue forecasting and analytics team. And, uh, right up your alley. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really cool. And it was something that I, um, I, when I got the offer, I remember getting the offer and talking to my dad and sort of similar to when I, when I was like with, with my test score and I had to work hard to get, you know, to, to figure that out and, and do better. I remember I got this offer. I remember calling my dad and saying, dad, I'm scared. Like, I don't think I can do this job. Like I, I think these people are way smarter than me. I don't think I'm ready for this. And I said, you know, what if I go do this and I just, I fail. And he goes, He's like, if they give you an offer, you have to take it. Like, you got to go do this. And it might be hard, and that's okay. But they wouldn't have given you an offer if they didn't think you could do the job. And so you should go do it. And um, I was like, okay. But I was scared. I was really scared. And I remember I, I went and I took this job. I moved to San Francisco. I, you know, I felt it was so cool. It was so fun. I remember I drove... Every time I've moved uh, as, a, as an adult, I've driven to something I've become very, it, it's like, it, it's such a fun, liberating, it feels like the rite of passage to say I'm like entering this new experience. And so I, uh, I drove from DC to San Francisco, 42 hour drive by myself, um, got a bunch of stuff in my car. And I, I remember... It was such an amazing drive, and I remember I, you know, I called friends, I listened to music, I, uh, and when I got to San Francisco, I mean, I, I was just like, oh my gosh, like I'm here, like this is so cool. There was even something really funny. I was getting off the highway, and I remember I saw a billboard. Um, it's right after you get off the 101, kind of onto Market Street, and I see this billboard, and it just says "Cannabis Reimagined," <laughs> and I'm like, I'm here, nice, <laughs> welcome to the Greenland. And so, it, you know, and the, like, it, that was so cool. Um, the, the team I, I worked on, I ended, it ended up being an amazing experience. It was hard though. And I think that a, a theme that I've noticed in my life is like, it, 
the way my dad describes this is he calls them oh shit moments. It's those moments where you need to put yourself in a position where you go, oh shit, I'm not ready for this. But you can do it, but it's not going to be easy and it's going to be hard and it's going to freak you out a little bit. But it, it, it forces so much growth that, that you need to have those every every so often, every couple of years I found. And so um, I did that. It was great. I, rem- I mean, I remember though, there was a time... So most of the people I worked with were all like ex-investment bankers. I'd never made a financial model before. So I joined this job. We start, these people are just cruising through. through. Don't listen to this. Yeah, yeah, right. (laughs) I had no idea what I was doing. And I remember, I mean, my my boss, Brandon, was so supportive. Um, And so was Sam, who was my first boss. But I remember there was a time when we started going into a really like rigorous period. And I just went into a conference room one night and just started crying and just called my parents. And I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, I do not know how to hang with these these people because they've all done this before um and then the next day i i told my boss and he just sat me down for two hours in a conference room and just like taught me everything from scratch and and uh and i was like okay cool like i this, I, I think i get it now and um and that was a real turning point i think it all everything kind of started clicking after that um and so yeah, that that was a great experience, um, and that that brought me out to to the Bay Area, which I've been here for almost five years. Um, I was at Facebook for another like two and a half years. It feels like you you've established a relationship with your parents where they are sort of like consulting you, and this is not the first time that I'm hearing that from you. Yeah. By the way, like yeah. I always hear like good things, like. Hey, I, I consulted with my dad, like yeah. my grandma. Like this is my grandma's birthday. Like, uh, tell tell me a little bit yeah. about that, if 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 you're if you don't mind, because I feel like it, there, there's something there about you and like how you built that relationship and what you see in it. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I I mean, my parents have been great consultants, supporters, everything throughout my life. I think my dad, in particular, when it comes to work, has been. Um, you know, education work has been a really great just mentor. Um, he he t- he's a very like supporting his family was everything to him, and I think that that is very ingrained in his DNA. Is like the my role as the father in the family is to provide and and help my kids grow as you know as much as possible. And so it, it's really great, and I think. It helps so much to like have those people in your life who are willing to, who, who can help you, who will listen to you. Um, you know, if you want advice, they'll give you advice. If you don't want advice and you just want to feel heard, they'll do that too. And um, my parents, my sister, my grandmother, um, you know, my grandfather passed away this year or last year, but he uh, he was was the same way. And I. Um, it, it helps so much to have those people in your life. And I think that, you know, as I think about um, my experience with loss, I, it was it was even more true then. And recognizing that, like, you, you can't solve all the problems yourself. You don't know all the answers. And, like, I, leaning on other people, again, even just as, like, a sounding board is, is so, yeah, so huge. That's that that makes a lot of sense to me too, to be honest. Like and the more I'm talking about this project too, mm-hmm. a lot of people, the more I see different aspects of it, which originally is just an idea. Hey, just talk to people about their yeah. story of pain and what happens after and then the good things or neutral thing that comes after that. And I think this this is really this has been such a great finding for me to just do this more and more like that huh. we always carry some hesitations mm-hmm. like i don't know like for me it's definitely my insecurities yeah. like my my personal experience with being bullied or whatever i always like try to hide mm-hmm. a lot it was also like culturally not encouraged as much yeah. whereas like i think coming to the u.s like this act, by the way like today marks 10 years of me being oh my gosh congratulations yeah it's wow. like I think coming uh, to this country, like I, I started like getting exposed to kind of like different way of communicating, and it it took so long to be honest. Like it's been very long. It, it's been very hard to kind of like 
understand how to open up mm. how to open up enough to like to not regret it later kind of like build the steps yeah. and now i'm I, I feel like i'm at the, at the stage where like if i if i have the right uh, friendship or relationship i mean it doesn't have to be close friendship yeah. i start like okay this is this is a good opportunity for me to open up mm-hmm. and echo yeah. and hear it hear what i'm thinking and then allow other people to tell me how i'm thinking and like show me different corners yeah. of it, which is very interesting. So I think it's awesome. it's one of those interesting things I personally learned in the American culture, and I'm th- so thankful for it. Also thankful to the friends that I had who helped. So fast forwarding, I so applied to college. I ended up going to Northwestern. My friend me here also uh, went to Northwestern. Uh, it, you know, what was really funny is he gave me so much crap that we were going to the same school. He was like, I can't believe I work. He was a much better student than me, to be fair. But he's like, I work so hard and now we're going to the same school. <laughs> <laughs> he was actually too good of, a, of an advisor to me. <laughs> what did he study for? Uh, the same thing, industrial same. engineering. Industrial. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, I mean, it, it was, you know, we went to high school together. We were on the cross country team together. We were good friends. We go to college together We had the same major. Um, we were, you know, I and mean, we hung out all the time. And, and so uh, in the, let's see. So summer of 2014, uh, July 19th, 2014, um, I, well, I guess it was the morning. Let me actually, can I double check the date? So I get a call from a uh, a high school friend Colin on the so it was the 19th by the way or was it yeah so it was now this is Sunday July 20th 2014 I get a phone call from him and um he told me that there was a car accident where um me here and uh, our other friend uh, Sajad who we went to uh, high school with, but he went to a different college, went to Indiana, and then uh, they had been in a car accident, and the two of them had passed away, and there wasn't a lot more information at the time, um, and I remember that feeling where all you can hear is white noise, like all that was in my head was like static and I just I I was uh, living in Evanston uh, so where Northwestern is that summer and I all I remember is just like screaming and I uh, I didn't even know at the time that our so our, a friend of ours uh, uh, who went to college with us, uh, Mike, he was driving the car. And uh, what had happened was uh, they had been drinking. He swerved off of a, a bending road uh, and there was a pond and uh, the car went into the pond and um, and uh, me here and Sajad both drowned and then Mike got out and survived. Um, and there's no, there, there are no words to describe the level of just shock and trauma in that, in that moment when someone, three people age 21, you know, young and kids are in, it, when that happens. And, um, I was living with a few friends that summer, and so I uh, I shared the the news with them, and uh, it it was the worst day of my life. I mean, I again, I just was in complete shock and um, was so just broken as a, as a person, um, and so you know as the a few days later there was a there was a funeral and so that was uh, in our in our hometown and uh, for there was one for me here and there was one for Sajad and uh, 
I'll say, like, there were... Mir's funeral had, I want to say, like, 500 people attend. Um, I, I was sharing this with you. I He he worked uh, a job at the school. He ran, like, a kind of a school-run student shipping company. So it's like in the summer, students could store all their stuff and then have it delivered to them when they when they move back in in the fall. And... He worked. He did that, and it was like a student-run company, and they had a bunch of people that they paid uh, to to help them move things. And all of those people, he used to he used to hang out with these guys and you know drink a beer after work in the back of the truck together. All of those people showed up, like, and they weren't students; they were just you know people that they hired to to work. Um, and and I mean, the level of impact that this that he had on on so many people it was incredible. Um, and so I was there with my family and um, I'm very close with his family and uh, his, you know, uh, we sat next to his parents and his brother. Um, it was very hard. I, I gave a speech and I remember just thinking that there's no way I'm going to be able to get up there and, and say, I mean, what do you say in such a situation? Um, but I... A thing that I learned, and I, or, or at least I, uh, um, I tried to keep a certain mentality, was this person had such an influence on my life and made me a far better person than I ever could have been uh, without him. And I kept trying to tell myself, you know, don't leave this situation worse off than had he never been in my life at all and it's very hard but it's it's something where i think having something amazing and then that thing going away you still had that thing that person whatever for for that time and and that was sort of what i conveyed when i i spoke at the funeral and like that was I think a lot of that was what kept me as I was then going through the stages of grief was something that I very much tried to keep as my motivation to just keep every day getting through the day and and doing that over and over and over. That is, um, I mean, I'm. This is the second time I'm hearing this, but that's still nerve wracking. Especially, I feel like I, I kind of like relate to this story personally, just on personal level, but also like on kind of like just understanding like the immigrant the immigrant life yeah. like you yeah. know his parents like they came to the country just like i did like yeah. try to make a life and and it's I, ca I can't imagine how hard it's been for them yeah. it's so tragic and like i can cannot even empathize honestly with what you went through as like someone who had such impact in uh, such early ages of life with you 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 mentioned something about stages of grief like mm -hmm. what are what were those for you in that experience yeah i mean i you know like like most people going through the process I, it, it it was there was an amount of denial at the beginning right and i it took some time you know a few weeks to even just like recognize that this happened and this person is not in my life so you're you know far from acceptance but even just recognizing like this was a thing that happened that took a few weeks i mean even that was like i, I was just how could such a thing how did this happen right and so i i sought out uh my my parents were i i, I am so grateful for how like hands-on and supportive they were through this because 
I got, I got a therapist like immediately. And that was huge because I think that, you know, you don't, you can't work through this on your own. And it, it's a, all loss is unique to the individual going through it, but there is a process. There are stages of grief and almost, you know, almost all forms of grief follow those steps. And so, you know, acknowledging that, I think my parents were very supportive in saying like, you need to see a therapist and see that this person as much as you need. And, but you need to have someone that you're, you're seeing, you know, regularly. Um, and, and that started, you know, a, a couple of weeks after he passed away. And, um, I saw the, my therapist for about a year, the, the whole school year, um, the following year. And, uh, but yeah, I, I think the one thing that I, a, a challenge of going through grief is that there is a, a balancing act of acknowledging that you need to give yourself the the space and the being kind and easy to yourself so that you can have the necessary time to go through those steps but also knowing that almost like a board game there are it's sequential and there's a beginning and there's an end and getting through those steps but doing so at a at a pace that allows you to not get stuck in any one step so that you're still progressing through this process i think is really important and i i've seen uh people deal with loss and maybe not make it all the way through and and get stuck and i think that i had so many you know friends family uh outside help like a therapist that were so helpful even a bunch of my professors at school knew how close i was with him and we were in the same major and so they i mean they were helpful too and um what is it what is it about i think i think therapists we are all familiar with and we, we can get to it uh which by the way is not like I, I'm not a therapist, you're not a therapist, Definitely. I don't have anything to say, but I think like that's an interesting topic to also still talk about because a lot of people are hesitant to go to. But as far as like talking to close enough friends and professors and teachers, people who knew you, like what was about that that could be helpful for you? Yeah, absolutely. It. I think it gets it like you... There's only so much that you can do just as one person to get yourself through this process. And what, what, what I found is that all people have dealt with loss of, of various forms. And it was incredible how much support I got and, and how much people open up when you tell them that you're going through something and they, they share their experiences. They uh, provide perspective, but they also know you and they can understand you know not only their experiences but how how are you doing through this process and, and how that they can help um and so i i think that that was it, it was huge i mean i i just you you can't do it alone and um and it felt like i i both I, I learned a lot from other people um but there were some hard days i mean some days where i'm just i couldn't it felt like I couldn't do motivate myself to do anything. And then there were days where, you know, school and work were a great distraction from how I was feeling. And I think those distractions are really important, but also recognizing that you still have to go through the process of grief and you can't just use work as a a crutch to say like oh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through that process and I'm just gonna go do this other thing. Yeah. But it is it is a helpful crutch when when you need it. That's interesting because I think a lot of time people who get stuck, and I'm not gonna make any assumption because you still have the story to tell. But a lot of time when people are stuck in the loss is because they just use a lot of these distractions to not think about 
that specific event, especially when it comes to loss, because your body is not even attached to it. You, you don't have any physical n- notes of it to carry around and like keep looking at like, oh my God, what is that? Uh, and then get get your trauma back. Like it's it's sort of easy to be distracted, but there are times that the time comes and you're like, holy moly, like how can I continue this day? Like you just feel, you just suddenly feel like a lot of pressure on your chest f- physically. And I think like what you're saying is very interesting is like, yes, those distractions are good, but don't forget that you have to, you have to go through that process of dealing with the loss uh, experience. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting about uh, the pain that comes from losing someone is at the same time that it's not your body but it's sort of feeling like your cycle of life like for example with your experience it's been a me here who has been helping and as a matter of fact he has been making all the decisions for you right (laughs) so it's he's been part of your brain in a way but so like you you want to maybe go through making a decision and like he's just like and then those times actually hit harder than usual like was there any situation like that for you Oh, absolutely. Uh, there were, you know, music is such an interesting way to like remember people, remember times in your life. And he actually had said a long time ago that uh, if if he ever passes away, that he wants people to listen to the Black Album by Jay Z. There you go. And, and <laughs> which is maybe not the album you would you would think someone like, but 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 it's interesting. I I have now listened to that album cover to cover uh, like uh, you know hundreds of times probably and it's actually an album that there's a ton about loss and that's a very big theme in the album and it it makes me remember him so like viscerally um and i still I, i love that album i listen to that album all the time um, there are other songs that I would listen to and I just, I would remember him. And so it's like things like that very much like lock some of those memories in time where you can just like so easily go back to nine years ago, I was here. And this reminds me of that time. I probably find that I'm someone who indexes more on like trying to push myself along in the process and and be like you know how can i live on in his memory i'm I'm probably more on the end of someone who would use other things as a way to block this out of their mind than you know get stuck in one of the steps and i'm so grateful for having like having people who recognize that and would like help me along in in these stages as i went um because you're and you're going through it with all of your friends you're like a cohort of people all going through this together and some days i felt like i was the one who was broken and needed someone else to help me and and some days you're that you know it's the other way and your your friend is really struggling and you help them i spent a lot of time um, on the phone with his family and, you know, and, and they, they lived in our hometown. And so it was very easy to go see them. And so I saw them a lot and I mean, I love them. They're such great people, but it was hard. It was really hard. It wasn't easy. Those, I mean, there were times I'd go to their house and we would just sort of sit there, at, you know, for, for minutes on end, not saying anything and just crying or just, you know, but being with them, having any, you know, just companionship, someone who knew uh, their son, someone they loved so well, uh, you know, and they were so supportive, you know, of me and, uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned, um, your parents kind of like, uh, providing that confident, presence and then kind of like connecting you to therapy like Mm -hmm. uh, however you're comfortable sharing some of that experience in therapy because i feel like a lot of people they that i know they haven't had even a single therapy session 
And yes, I, I know there are so many things against it. Like there are so many excuses to not do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not always going to be perfect. Yeah. It's totally. just like any other story of life. Like yeah. you go to a restaurant, it's not going to be perfect, but sometimes it's actually a very, very good yeah. food. So like how, how has that experience been for you? However, you want to share about your therapy sessions mm -hmm. or like, absolutely. You know, I think that uh, I, the way I think of a therapist is it's just a, 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 a neutral third party. So a, a wonderful sounding board who is trained in ways to help people in various, you know, li living their life challenges or not, you know? Um, and I, I think that, and they, and they've seen a lot, they have a lot of perspective on, you know, um, other people's lives and how they've dealt with different, you know, circumstances. And so it almost felt like it's just a, like, like, it, it, you know, you, when you have a good conversation with a friend, like we've had, sometimes that feels like a therapy session. Right. And so I, I think, uh, for me, it was just like having that person and it's the consistency of it too. It's building a rapport with someone who understands you, understands uh, you know, where you are in your life. If you're going through something like loss, kind of helping you through that, that process. And, and it was really great. And I, I think it was something that I, um, you know, I saw this person for about a year, um, was extremely helpful. And, and then I stopped, but it's something that in, in some ways I kind of wish I still, you know, it, it, it was helpful to have even, when I felt like I was feeling better to have someone to check in with. And so um, that's something that I even would like to do more of is probably have someone that I check in with every so often. Um, yeah. What was some of the sort of, just, just to help everyone to get a picture of, hey, therapy is not scary. Yeah. What was kind of some of the conversations you may have, like where, where those conversations went, like without saying a specific if you totally. In a way, it didn't feel all that different from some of the things we're discussing. It it was, you know, you go to, go to an office, you sit in a room, sit on a couch, something like that. And um, I mean, a lot of it initially was to understand my background, understand my upbringing, uh, understand the relationship that I, I had with me here, you know, to help with this circumstance. But a lot of what, what one thing I realized that was really uh, important is to understand how you handle your life is to understand how you were raised, experiences you've had, past trauma that you've had, and I think it's it's one of those things where it's very easy to think to kind of like have recency bias in your life where you forget that like the way you are now could be because of something that happened 20 years ago and or or the you know the way you were raised when you were a, a child and so I think that was one thing I took away from it which is like you are a product of many years you know your entire life and and, and that's one thing and then the other thing is just once you kind of get to a point where that you know that person understands you and your background and something you're going through there were a lot of techniques that she could use to to help me think through something that I just didn't have didn't know and so um and, and also just being knowledgeable in the process of grief and knowing the steps knowing what's a you know a normal amount of time I mean no, no loss is normal but like what, what do you see as a standard amount of time that someone might spend in each of these stages to be able to say hey you know are we at risk of maybe getting stuck in one of these places and how can we keep you, um, you know, moving along and, and uh, coming to terms with this? That's amazing. Y you mentioned something that I'm such a big believer, like about like this recency bias that we have. The way that we are reacting to that experience, it's not just because we lost someone that we loved so much in that day, which is still a big deal, but it's also because how our brain yeah. and how our mind and body even, like 
we're trained in the past few many years to react and potentially save us on that day that yeah. the event happens. So like we we had all like when you were 21, let's say you had 21 years of training, yeah. good or bad, however it was to get to that day, to survive in that day. And you survived for the most part and for some part you needed a therapist and friends and then you you're 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 good after it. So it's I think it it's that piece that people sometimes forget and I even didn't know like when I personally dealt with the experience of loss like I just felt like okay yeah I lost my dad and that naturally I have to be sad but there are layers there was layers of um uh, trauma that kind of like unwrapped over even now it's been 9 years from my dad's loss and I'm still unwrapping some of those like there are nights that i wake up with like some memories and i'm like how did my brain block this like and i think like that that kind of like it, that's the important part where i i think going through that therapy or talking to friends yeah there's nothing more helpful than that to be honest yeah. kind of like yeah. taking your brain taking your learnings out yeah. right and like put it on the whiteboard yeah when it comes to grief, it's one of those interesting topics because there's so much about the event itself, especially if it's that traumatic, mm -hmm. like what happened to me here um, and how close you were to him. Like the event itself is so traumatic that you, you forget about why you are reacting the way you are reacting. Yeah. But like when you, when you go deep, it's like so many interesting things. Um, yeah. what, along, along that line, I'm, I'm kind of like curious. If first of all, if you if you have anything to say about this, too, is how you see how you reacted to your past. Yeah. Um, so this is where other other people are just so helpful. Therapists, friends, family. It's like you can. There's only so much that you can understand about yourself being in your physical body and mind like it it there is so much value in just someone who isn't you looking at how, what you're doing what what you're thinking and being able to say hey you know okay i get this i don't get this here's how i did this even just one person you know just breaking out of it just being you and so and then if you have multiple of those people and, and, and you, you know, and they can help you, I mean, that's, that's so important. And so I think it's like, you're not in this alone. A lot of people have gone through loss. Like I, I, in a way, as difficult as this was, there were certain parts of my like outlook on the world that improved. Like I had more faith in humanity when I saw how many people were willing to talk to me about their loss and their relationship with loss and how accommodating people were. Um, the the woman, uh, Dr. Jill Wilson, if you're listening, uh, she ran our, our uh, industrial engineering department and was incredible. She was so accommodating with me about my classes and everything. And I, I just, it was amazing how much how helpful everyone was. And so I, you know, it can be hard, but I, it felt like a, many of my relationships actually got better. It's like I lost a, an incredible relationship, but I gained tens, twenties, you know, maybe a hundred better relationships. Uh, I'm much closer with me here and his family. And I, I, I don't think we would ever be as close as we are now uh, had we not been through this together. That's amazing. Two things. One is how learning from this experience yep. changed, if anything, in your life. Yep. Two is how 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 are you going to keep yourself up, like consistent, like this these things are not going to go away from mm -hmm. your brain. Yeah, like, absolutely. How are you going to keep yourself up, like, and then like, and then we can we can maybe make from that. But do you have anything yep. else in mind? Yeah. No, I I think that sounds great. I so. I, when this happened, I was in the, in the middle of, uh, interning at, at LinkedIn that summer, 
my team there was amazing. My mentor Sharice was awesome. And she, I mean, like, again, just like the accommodations and just people's like willingness to help was so great. And so I, that was a very hard summer. We go, we go back to school. It's, you know, senior year of college. This is supposed to be this amazing, fun time. And I, uh, it was very difficult. And I, you know, there were things that we did on campus. There was like a vigil and all of the, you know, um, but it was, it wasn't sort of the standard great senior year that everyone thinks about. But I, again, what kept me grounded was I, I can't be worse off for having known this guy. And I would even joke with myself. I'd even say, look, if he knew how much I was crying right now, he would make fun of me so bad, you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, I can't, you know, and so, and it's, you just keep on keeping on and you just keep pushing and you keep, you know, some days you distract yourself, some days you sit in your room and cry all day and you can't, you know, feel like you do anything and, and you just keep the great people in your life and you just keep going and and now, I mean, I think that that was the, the formula that I really followed. And, you know, consistently, I saw a therapist every week. And I think eventually you moved to monthly. Um, but it was every week for six months or something. It was a long time. It was a lot. And, you know, even the process of just finding a therapist, I saw a handful of people before I found someone that I... Yeah, what was really that liked. process look like? You know, it's hard because you don't, if you, I had never had a therapist before, I, I didn't know, I didn't know what, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I found that it was, uh, but what, what's interesting is when you have the first meeting, if you don't feel like a warmth and a connection that works for you, it's probably not going to. And so don't, one thing I tried to do is not convince myself that maybe something would change and it would work i tried to be like look if if i don't feel this connection there's no sense in trying to force through it so we should just move on and there there's also this whole challenge of like the the therapist breakup you know and i think with that it was you know it's i, I had to tell myself and recognize like this is a business for them this is their career they're going to get, they're going to get new patients. They're going to lose patients. And that's just how it goes. And, uh, and so trying to be very honest and open about like, and come to a pretty quick decision of like, do I, do I connect with this person? And if I don't, then let's, let's keep going because there's many of them to choose from and, and finding one that you connect with, like putting in the additional time, the additional work up front to finding the right person right. pays off in spades Absolutely. over the long term because you're going to, I mean, you're going to talk to this person every week for six months about the hardest thing you've ever gone through. Yeah. So it, it's it's kind of actually, I think it's very important to know, yes, finding the right therapist is hard, but it's sort of like a dating. And we hear yeah, this a lot. Absolutely. But yeah. It's worth it. Yeah. If, if you're dating someone uh, and it doesn't work, that's fine because at least you're not going to spend the rest of your life with them. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like <laughs> you, you go in on enough dates and you invest enough so that you find the right person for you yep. and for them. You, t you tell this person potentially more than you tell anyone, right? I mean, this, this might be the person that you share the most with of anyone in your life. That's crazy, right? And so uh, the, the upside is really high if you, if you find the right person. And, and on, the, on the other end of it, the downside is really low if it doesn't work because this can be such a powerful um, you know, tool and resource that it, yeah, getting it right yeah. is really important. Yeah. How are you dealing with post uh, trauma experiences from that event? Like, are there days that that memory comes back? If so, like, what are what? How how is that experience? Yeah, and then how how you keep yourself back up? Yeah, you know I. So it will be nine years this July, and I, you know, that's a long time. But I, I feel like even just in in uh, 
thinking about this conversation today, I mean, I, I've cried now, I've cried earlier in the day, and I, uh, there's still a lot of emotion, and I think there always will be. I, you know, I, a theme, you know, again, is just like, how do you put a, a positive spin mm. on what the experiences that you had with that person and bringing them with you? And, you know, maybe you just lost the funniest person you've ever met. And now your friend group maybe isn't as funny as they used to be, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to take some of his jokes with you. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think again, music, there's so much music. Every time I listen to Jay-Z or, you know, he, I mean, he loved hip hop music. I, uh, I will, I, I think of him. And so I, it's, there's always going to be emotion that's, you know, it's going to exist. And I think trying to think about the positives, think about a funny joke and laugh. I mean, I, I laugh to myself about jokes that he made all the time, like some re regularly. I, I get this. <laughs> it, it's like the two thing I hear you're saying is like one is to acknowledge it and let the emotion go. Cause a lot of time we just try to kill that emotion yeah. right there. Yeah. That that's amazing too. Is find, using that as an opportunity to remember him yeah. in a, in, a, in a good way. I think that's that's what we are, we forget. Like those people made an impact in our lives, and it's great to be remembered. Uh, following that, I, I'm kind of wondering how did that event and what you learned from it and to, going through this kind of like uh, made a change in your life about other relationships you may have. Yeah, certainly. I think there's. I, it's, it's kind of the whole, uh, like, you know, hug your family a little tighter when you see them, you know? And I think it's, it's like really life is very fragile. And while we are very durable, resilient creatures, you can die in a moment's notice. You drive a car every day, you can crash and die. That, you know, and that, that is a thing that could happen and it happens a lot, way more than it should. And so I, I think it's recognizing how lucky we are to, you know, be alive in this place and the beauty of life while also not taking for granted just like how fragile life is, how fragile your health is and taking care of yourself, telling loved ones you appreciate them, staying in touch, you know, calling, picking up the phone and calling someone uh, to catch up with them. I think I, I, I put more of an emphasis on that now. Um, the other thing too is I, I think more uh, now about the memory I want to leave behind. And it wasn't a thing I ever really thought about. And it, it I it's from this experience, but I do often think like, you know, if I were to pass away, how do people remember me? And I think trying to be a good person, have good relationships and live a life that you are proud of. And if it today, if it were to end, like, is, is that a, are, are you happy about the memory that you're leaving with others? Yeah. That reminds me of that Avicii song. <laughs> My father told me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's a, it's like it, in a way it, it, it feels like, and not to just jump right into a conclusion, but it feels like every loss and your story is similar to, again, to, to mine and like a lot of other people that I hear their stories closely, which is like, Hey, it's like now looking at perspective, I lost this person. Um, they were very close to me, but hey, I have a new appreciation for life. Yep. Like after that event and after dealing with the trauma of it, I try to spend more quality time with my f family or friends. I try to do this. I try to take care of my body yep. more and Absolutely. more. I try to do this. I try to tell my friends, don't drink and drive consistently yeah. so that that thing doesn't happen. It's yeah. like the, the the good that comes from massive grief, I think, if we are paying, this is my idea, if we are paying so much cost for those events, which we have to, like these are hard yeah. events, like at least let's get the best out of it in yeah. long run. Yeah. With it's such investment. Yeah. 
by dealing with the pain and for you it took about a year and for for me or someone else more or less we 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 invest enough it's like finance like you're the expert here like we invest enough in this situation that let's get the best out of it and it feels like that's what's been the case for you but in general how do you keep your mental health in a sane state like how 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 can you make sure like okay Brad's mental health is good and i know for a fact you you're someone who cares about it so much so what are some of the tactics you use on a daily basis yeah certainly um so i i think that it's important to understand the inputs to your body and your mind and then how that impacts the outputs how you feel how you your energy levels your mood uh your you know your physical health and i i had a day like 5 years ago it was when i was i was at that job and this was actually i think it, at facebook i think it was after the week where i think i cried and called my parents and i was like oh my gosh this i'm so overwhelmed these people are so much smarter than me how can i do this and so i told myself that saturday i said i'm going to take a mental health day and what i call a mental health day to me was i'm going to just walk around the city i'm going to and i'm going to do whatever makes me happy i sat in a park for a few hours and one thing i i wanted to do was I wanted to write down the inputs to my body and then the outputs and how it made me feel. And so the inputs were exercise, sleep, hours worked or just like how much I've been working, time with family and friends, so those four, and then alcohol consumption um or coffee or anything like any like sort of things that make you feel bad. And so it was those five things and i said these are the inputs to oh and actually there was a sixth one it was being outside uh and time outside and so there were six things and so um and wait did i say all that? there was exercise too there were like there were like six or seven things anyway i wrote all these inputs down and i said these are the factors these are the things that like make me feel i can map how i feel to these things and um i basically then i try to keep that list in my head and kind of know like where am i on these various things and it's like you can hack certain things for a period of time but it won't work forever you can be like ah i'm not going to sleep that much and i'm going to drink more coffee but you know that that system breaks after like oh yes you know you can't do that forever right especially when you pass 30 yeah. Those, those yeah yeah it only gets harder as you get older right <laughs> So it's exercise, diet, spending time with friends and family, work, sleep, time spent outside, and alcohol or coffee yeah, consumption. Exactly. Versus Seven hydration, things. I would yes, say. Right? Exactly. Yeah, because that that's Seven like things. one of the big ones for me, to be honest. Like hydration is magical. Yeah, that's a good point. And so, yes, and those things that they're they're so important. And what I've realized is that you like like tracking those things for you. And the other thing, though, is I, while the set of things might be fairly consistent across people, and you know some different variables for different people. For the most part, I think that doesn't change as much as how does your body, what level of input, and what's the level of output that that yields. Right? Like some people can sleep five hours and be really productive. Some people need to sleep nine hours to be productive. So knowing where you are, it's almost like what's the weight of each of those things, right? And how does that then impact how you feel, uh, your energy levels, your mood? And so really having an understanding of that. And then there's certain things where it's like, if the weight is really high, like I'll, I'll have a weekend where I say, I'm going to spend a ton of time with friends. Uh, this weekend was a great example of that. Uh, I probably did really great on the fr time with friends and family one, but I also failed miserably on the alcohol one. <laughs> yeah. But I'm really happy for it. <laughs> and yeah. So I, I think recognizing that and saying, hey, that's okay, because I, I know I'm going to be so happy. I saw Ali, I saw Katie and Mike, I saw 
all my buddies, you know, it's like, I saw all these people and I, I know that will make me really happy. I know that will uh, make me feel good. So I try to really balance those things. And I, I also think, I mean, I think consistently exercising, it, it, no matter what amount, even if it's like run one mile, I try to do this thing where I force myself to run one mile almost every day. And there, I just think forcing yourself to like break a sweat, get your heart rate up is so important. And I can feel it when I don't. When I don't, I feel like cagey. I feel a little like more bottled up, right? And when you do, it's like you, it's it's like a release, right? You your your heart rate gets up, and you just feel like okay, I've you know, even if it's not a like a huge workout, it's something. Yeah, it's. I just want to tap on exercise because. I've been guilty of not doing it right for long times in my life because for the most part, I never felt like I'm too overweight. And that was the excuse for me to work out a lot of time. I'm like, okay, I'm not overweight. I'm I'm fine. And then, no, it's not that. It's like, it's not about how much you weigh or not. It's, it's about how active you are. And then there was a time where I'm like, oh my God, like so much pain started coming. How to remove those pain, but either by should I just protect myself and do nothing or actually, in fact, do more things? Yeah. There are like, there are people who go like so deep into that. Like, I mean, one of our uh, mutual friends, he was telling me like he's doing like jujitsu on like daily basis for yeah. an hour. And I get it. It just takes so much of your focus and like, like your energy that you're like, okay, like I'm done for the day. Um beside the one mile run, which I actually think it's it's actually an easy thing to yep. uh, follow. Beside that, are there any other routine exercises or activities that you do to keep and help your mental health? Whenever I'm stressed about something, I try to say, hey, it's okay. Whatever this thing is, it's like, it's not that big of a deal. It's fine. But then the other thing is recognizing that like, other people have gone through what you've gone through. Like our problems, while the, the circumstances might be unique to you, the problem, the underlying thing is actually probably not you, that unique. And many people have gone through. And what's cool is if you believe that, you can then use it as an opportunity to have a lot of great conversations with other people who have probably gone through something pretty similar. And so while the way in which I lost my best friend might not be the same way that someone else has dealt with loss. Loss is a thing almost everyone has dealt with. Yeah. What would you say to those people yeah. that when they're even in the stages of the grief, yeah. they, they say, you know what? Like, I just lost my dad. Like, let me have all the alcohol. Let me have all this. Like, don't don't question yeah. this. Like, what would you say to them yeah. guys or gals? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I th- there were times I did that, and I uh, I think the first thing is that it's normal. Uh, I think a lot of people think that, uh, but and I think it's this is where having like outside help was really useful because. No one will fault you for doing that once. No one might fault you for doing that three times, five times. I don't know. But if that becomes like a really routine pattern, then that's concerning. And recognizing like at what point does that go from being like, hey, understandable, you're going through something really tough to no, this is now a problem where you're not progressing, you're not feeling better, you're not moving on and and it's, you know, it's, it's maybe making you, you worse off. You kind of move from like, Hey, an understandable, normal thing. You need a release to this is actually impacting your ability to go through the stages of grief. I think is, uh, is, is important. Um, I I also think it's, you learn a lot about like, I feel like I learned a lot about delayed gratification going through loss Because forcing yourself, no matter how hard it is, trying to force yourself to say, I'm going to go work out. I'm going to, you know, maybe today not drink my emotions away or something, you know, whatever unhealthy uh, thing you might have as a release, uh, food, for example, um, how can you not 
do that thing and go do the thing that makes you happy over the long term. But it's hard. I mean, it, there's a level of discipline and, and, and I was certainly not, not great at that all the time. And I think just having people in your life that will push you and keep you on the right track and keep you moving forward while also being understanding and knowing that not every day is going to be perfect. I think yeah. that's so important. Yeah. That ma- that that makes a lot of sense and that that's the truth. I think uh th- th- that's why it makes sense because it's it's how natural it is. Like if you're doing if you're five uh, beers in the day, it goes after a week and then then your the formula that you were talking about earlier uh, alcohol consumption, exercise, and all, all the yeah. six, seven yeah. thing, that formula is kind of like not working anymore. It's Correct. Not Correct. Yes. That means that you yeah. are putting more into your body of the things that probably is not good for your health, much of it, and you're not getting more good in the relationships yeah. and the exercise out of it. Like if you're drunk, if you're drinking seven days a week, it's going to impact your exercise. It's going to yeah. impact your blood pressure and everything. Yeah. So that's eventually going to impact your health. Mm-hmm. So the formula that Brad taught us is not going to work. So, well, j- that's a good measure to know yeah. that you're doing it too much and start being concerned. Uh, I I kind of want to wrap this, but this, this, this was a great conversation. Before wrapping though, I kind of want to know like, how you're uh, kind of like thinking moving forward. Mm-hmm. Like that's a that's a loss that w- happened in 2014, you mm-hmm. said. And now like moving forward, like what, what are the things from that event and similar events that you heard in your life that you would apply learnings from those yep. similar losses? Yeah, you? absolutely. Um, I, I really think that the... Uh, live a life that I'm happy about, I'm excited about. It's have relationships with people that I'm, that are, you know, healthy, are mutually beneficial, are are like deep and rooted in love and in the ability to express yourself and learn and grow and develop through other people. I mean, I read way less than I should, but I feel like the way I learn is through conversation. And I feel like if, if I have a bunch of friends who are much smarter than me and I just talk to them, then I learn from them. Like they read all these crazy things. I'm going to go like, you know, try to download that from them. And I, I think that that's something I love doing. And I'm so grateful for all of the really thoughtful, intelligent, friendly people in my life that help me learn and grow every day. Um, but I think I, probably the most like the the single biggest thing that I probably learned is just like, just keep going, just keep pushing. You can do this. You can, you'll be okay. And, and know that you will come out of this a better, stronger, more thoughtful person and with more perspective and better relationships. Like, like, so much you will you can come out so much stronger from a terrible terrible loss terrible things happening um and the the other thing too is uh, things don't always happen for a reason it's easy to try to associate meaning with things this was just a horrible tragic horrible thing that happened there's no meaning to that. I mean, it's just an awful thing that happened. And I, I felt like I was trying to figure out what did the, you know, what does this mean? And it's like, don't drink and drive. That's a bad thing to do. And, but horrible things just happen in the world. And, and I think that I tried to, I, you, you, it's easy to go down these spirals of being like, oh, what does this mean? There has to be some, and it's like, no, this was just a, a terribly unfortunate thing. And we got to just keep on keeping on, you know, and, and, and as, as a community of people who knew this guy, well, like we need to band together and be stronger people, uh, you know, for, for it. And I, I, I gotta say like w- one thing, one thing I have seen in you specifically, uh, has been 
how much respect you have for your friendship. Like you, you truly, like you spend quality time with your friends. Like mm-hmm. even in our conversations, you're always like 100% in. Mm-hmm. And like just hearing your stories and I'm not trying to like connect the dots and like be the uh, smart person in the room, but it it truly like w- what you're saying is I, I've seen it. Like mm-hmm. not j- just in our relationship, but I've seen it in, your friendship with other friends, like how much you care about spending quality time with them one-on-one, like the group of smaller friends. Like I've seen that. And I think like that, that to me is, uh, is kind of like a living example of like just being a good friend. So thank you for that, by the way. I mean, thank you. Yeah. You're, you're one of those friends who pulls these things out of me. I mean, I just, it's, it's incredible. Like I'm so grateful for having people in my life who like ask good questions or thoughtful. They think and like, cause you, I, it's amazing how much you can learn just from talking to other people. I mean, it, it's, a, it is, it is literally how I learn. Any any closing thoughts? Any any fun tips of what Brad would do? <laughs> no, I mean, if if you're going through something, uh, if you're going through loss, you're going through challenge. Uh, you can do it. I think you are you you're stronger and have more resilience than you might ever realize. And when, you know, when you are going through a challenging time, I think that that is when you learn the most about your character and your strength and your empathy as a person. And, you know, I I really think that you will come out of this stronger and uh, it, but it's hard to recognize that in the moment and just go with the process um, get help as you, as you need. And, uh, and it'll, you know, it'll be okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brad. Seriously. Been great. Thank, Thank you for being here and, uh, taking the drive, taking the time and everything. Beautiful. A great conversation. And thank you. Thank you. That was our conversation with Brad Winters. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I also highly recommend if you're suffering from any experience that you feel you need some support, please contact your medical experts, please contact your mental health experts. As far as the accountability campaign for this show, Brad is offering a one mile run per day for 30 days and he's going to join five of you for that. To sign up, please use the link in the notes for this show, and you can sign up to join Brad's campaign. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. We would love to get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you for tuning in to our episode one. This was our show. See you on episode two. Goodbye.